Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. It's hard to make the point in our 24-7 information-saturated society today, but all of us, politicians included, are a lot more than the worst or even the best thing we've ever done. Couple that with the fact that times change so quickly, values change, norms change, and what might have been acceptable to Don Draper, for example, would get him fired today. The same is true for race, the perhaps singular stain of our founders that we've worked 240 plus years to redress. It's a long, complicated story, and former Alabama Governor George Wallace was a part of it. Today, his daughter, Peggy Wallace Kennedy, tries to put her father's life in perspective. People like the great John Lewis have lent their hand to help her in that effort, just as our current president has tried to rekindle the hatred she has worked so hard to extinguish. Peggy Wallace Kennedy shares her recollections of her father and another time and another place in her new memoir, The Broken Road. Peggy Wallace Kennedy is a nationally recognized speaker, lecturer, and writer. Her father, George Wallace, and her mother, Lurleen Wallace, were both governors of Alabama. And it is my pleasure to welcome Peggy Wallace Kennedy here to talk about The Broken Road, George Wallace and a daughter's journey to reconciliation. Peggy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a delight to have you here. When did you first become politically aware growing up? We all have that moment in our, in our lives when suddenly we understand politics and, and kind of the, the political things going on around us. When, when did that happen for you growing up? It happened for me in a simplistic way uh, when I was 13. My father was inaugurated in 1963. I was 12 at that time, um, but five months later, after he was inaugurated, he stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama, and um, when he was inaugurated, you know, he gave the infamous segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever, and I remember thinking, I, I didn't understand what those words meant, but five months later, uh, I I did understand them uh, in, the, in, the, in the perspective that he was standing in the schoolhouse door to prevent two African-Americans from registering to go to college. And, it, and I was 13 at that time, and to me, it felt wrong. And so I thought it was wrong it felt wrong in my heart. And so that, I guess, is the beginning of the struggle I had uh, with my father's politics. Um, uh, so that was the beginning, but uh, it was a very simple at being at 13, of course. And did you have friends at the time that, that talked about it? I mean, obviously it was the news of the time. Did you have friends your age, friends in school that, that talked about it, that had attitudes and opinions about it? Well, my close friends knew how I felt. But most, uh, most everybody uh, else uh, just assumed that my father's politics were mine. So I had a hard time uh, uh, struggling with that also. Uh, so, and you really couldn't con convince anybody any different, and it was, it was really pointless to try to convince them because they were, they were convinced that his politics were yours. And so I just didn't try to convince other people. My, my uh, close friends knew how I felt. So all my life, uh, his politics were mine, but not really. <laughs> right. But, but in many ways, his politics, certainly at that point in time, were, were the popular politics in Alabama. It was, was what people accepted as the way it was. Talk about that. Yes. Um, in 1958, when he ran for governor the first time, he ran as a moderate. He, he ran uh, for more better schools and, and good roads, and uh, he ran against um, a real a real racist uh, who was backed by the Klan, and um, that 
and and his opponent won, and that's what people wanted. They wanted segregation, um, this separation of the races, and my father was devastated after that. He said, I think he started running for the next race the day after he lost. So what what happened, unfortunately, is he would have done anything to win that 62 governor's race, and he did. He chose power over principle. He threw his moral compass out the window, and he chose to use race and segregation to win that race. And he promised uh, his constituents that he would stand in the schoolhouse door, and he, he won that race. He would have done anything to win that 62 governor's race, and he did. What did you come to understand about the way that reflected his attitudes and his position in 62, reflected or didn't reflect who he really was, what he really believed at that point? Well, of course, looking back on it and growing up with him and uh, going through his change and all that, uh, he was not the same uh, father and a man that I knew uh, in '58, in '62. Uh, he he was just driven uh, toward politics, and um, and of course the '60s. Uh, in the '60s, you just had the you know the uh, the civil rights movement was just you know, really right out there. And so he was right, he was elected and and then uh, right in the middle of the civil rights movement. So everything happened there. And and he created, even though uh, the civil rights movement was going on, he created a climate here in Alabama to um, that made other people uh, go out and, you know, do... Uh, violent things. And so that was not the man that I knew in 58. But then when he had his change later on in his life, he did become the man and father I knew in 1958. Talk a little bit about that and and the change in his attitude after he was shot, after he was paralyzed, and that conversion, how that change came about. Well, I believe that he was shot for a reason. I think things happen for a reason. I was asked one time, why do you think he lived? I believe my father lived so he could change back to the man and father I knew. But he had to change uh, uh, his heart and come to realize the hurt that he had put on so many people. And that change did come, and that realization for him did come. Um, when he was uh, still in the hospital, in the beginning, Ethel Kennedy came to visit him, and Shirley Chisholm came to visit him. And Shirley Chisholm, I believe, was the one who planted the seed in his heart. And I could go on for an hour about her. And Barbara Lee, my sister Barbara Lee, Representative Barbara Lee from Oakland. Um, Barbara worked for uh, Congressman uh, Chisholm in her presidential campaign. And Shirley Chisholm said, I'm going to shut down the campaign for a week. I'm going to see Governor Wallace. Well, Barbara at that time was one of her campaign workers. And she said, I just can't believe we're going to see that racist. Shirley said, I'm going to see him. So Barbara was just in sense. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so Shirley Shism came and and they they prayed together and talked really low together. And I just really think that uh well my father said, What are your people gonna think of you coming here? And Shirley Chisholm said I wouldn't want something like this to happen to anyone else. And I just think that, um, I think it was, I just think it was her that 
planted that seed in his heart. And uh, later on, when my father was governor again, and Shirley Chisholm was still in Congress, there were some bills uh, that were um, about the South in Congress. And uh, uh, Congressman um, Shirley Chisholm called my father and said, could you uh, make a phone call here and there? You know how that goes, that's, and that's politics. And uh, he said, I will. And and those bills got passed. And so um, uh, Barbara and I have talked about that many times. And uh, Barbara, Lee, and I are now just our sisters, uh, and, and we love each other very much. Were there ever times that, that you thought you still live in Alabama? Were there, were there times that you thought about leaving, about putting all of that behind you? One of the strong themes of my book is coming to terms with your past. Not to forget your past, but to accept it. And so that's what I've had to do um, growing up and as an adult and, uh, and, and becoming an adult and marrying and have children. You accept your past. Uh, you look at it for what it was. Uh, uh, my book is the, is the truth the way I saw it, the truth the way I lived it. It's my own, own personal story. It's no one else's story. Um, and so you accept it, and you, and you move forward. And then um, I spoke for 10-plus years all over the country about peace and reconciliation because John Lewis was uh, very uh, uh, huge in my life and still is. And so I wanted to leave a legacy to my son different than the one that was left for me. So the book is a culmination of all the work I've done, and the book uh, is the, the legacy I'm leaving for my son. How do you look at Alabama today as opposed to, to the way it was in 1962? Well, I think we've come a long way, but you still have those that live in 1962 that are still living in 1962. I have had comments on my Facebook page that say, you know, your father put the biggest stain on this state uh, that will never be erased. Uh, my father uh, died in 1998, and uh, we're talking um you know, back in the 60s, not, I'm not saying that what he did was right, um, but some people just can't let go of it and move and move on. And I don't think we've had a better governor uh, since my father lost, left office, uh, except maybe for Kay Abbey, who, who she's a, our Republican governor now, but she and I have been friends for a very long time. Uh, uh, I think peop- I think there are a lot of people that still live in 1962, and that are and that are racist. You'll find a lot of racists anywhere you go. You will talk about your father's campaign for president and his desire to to do that. Talk a little bit about what you understood about that. Well, um, I write about it, you know, mm-hmm. but um, he just, those presidential aspirations were so uh, strong for him. And my mother ran for governor because she knew that that would help keep him uh, up there with, you know, presidential aspirations. Uh, unfortunately, my mother had cancer when she announced that she was going to run for governor. But she knew that that would keep his uh, uh, aspirations alive, but it would also benefit her children. She knew that uh, what she could do while she was in office was to, uh, what she did do for the 15 months that she was in office. She bought a home here. She furnished it. She did other personal things, 
uh, that uh, benefited us children because she knew she would pass away. Um, and I have a great chapter in the book that um, uh, where I come to the realization that that's what she did because I did not know she had cancer when she announced. And so uh, that she she ran to keep his presidential uh, aspirations alive, and um, he enjoyed uh, running for president. <laughs> he ran he ran a lot of times, and um, uh, I traveled with him in '68. And my mother had just died, and I had someone to ask me about you know, his policies. How, how could you stand on the stage and listen to all of his uh, policies and what he? I said, you know, I I don't really remember what the policies were. I just know I was devastated, heartbroken that, that my mother, uh, I didn't have a mother anymore. And he and I cried on the plane. We cried in the hotel rooms. We cried dinner. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, you know, that I, I that I knew what his policies were at that time. I was standing there, you know, and it was um, it was. The two of us wanting to be together, and he said, "I want you to come and travel with me before you go to college," and I and I did, and uh, and then of course he ran uh, a couple of more times up there, <laughs> um, and then of course when he got, go ahead. What did he think of the other politicians of the day? What were, were his attitudes about Bobby Kennedy and 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 Nixon and others? Well, I think he I I think he was. Um, I, I think he was probably fond of Bobby Kennedy, even though they, you know, um, tangled in um, uh, 63. But uh, Kerry Kennedy and I uh, uh, love each other very much. And um, um, Nixon, um, hmm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure that he cared much for him. I didn't care much for him either. So, um, um, I, you know, I'm sure he railed against them in speeches, but... I wasn't paying attention, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to be with my father, you know, when he was campaigning. And, of course, in 72, he was married, you know, and his wife traveled with him and everything. And um, that was, um, you know, that was a bright spot when he got married again, and that was a really bright spot. Uh, in his life and, and for um, all of us, too. He was very happy. And she travels with him. How difficult has it been for you to, to reconcile all of this over the years? Well, it's been a, a slow process. It's been a difficult process. But I love my father very much. And you just have to come to terms with the past um, and accept it. And you have to move on. And um, I was at a Q and A one time, and there was this one girl that she was crying because she said, "I just don't know how you can let go of all of this." I said, "No, I have not let go of of, of what my father uh, did and what my past was. I have not let go of that, and I have not forgotten it. But I have accepted it. There's a difference." But you have to move on. Uh, leaving a painful past behind is not always easy, but it's always, it is always right. And I think she understood, but uh, she was just very, um, I think she wanted me to uh, forget, forget the past. But you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to come to terms with it. And it was, it was a, process of uh, becoming a young adult and marrying uh, and I can I can remember where I was and who I was with when I realized that my father had created a climate in Alabama with his words and actions and deeds that made other people go out and do harm to other people. I, and I, that was a revelation for me, and it was a shock, and I, it, it just had to sink in, and it took me about a week for me to realize that you just, this was part of the past, of this past, 
and you and I, and I finally came to the realization that this that you know that was real. When you decided to to write this memoir, to write Broken Road, talk a little bit about what your your motivation was. Was was it something that you felt you needed to do? Was it something that you wanted to do for your father's legacy? Well, uh, mostly I wanted to write it because I wanted to leave a different legacy for my two sons. I wanted to uh, leave them a legacy of the work that I've done uh, on speaking up about peace and reconciliation. Because, but also I, I wanted to um, uh, let the reader know that um, you can come to terms with your past and you accept your past, but also that my, my father had the capacity to change uh, and, that, and the capacity to ask for forgiveness. And uh, that legacy that I'm leaving for my children will um, um, will be the great be the greatest thing I could ever do for them. And I wrote it because um, I wanted I wanted people to know it was that it's my personal story, and it was the way I saw my father, the way I lived with my father. So it's not. It's a story that's never been told, um, and so that that was that was uh, one of the things. It's a story that's never been told. So that's uh, Mark and I just uh, thought that might be a, a a really good way to get my personal story across. What do you think is the greatest misconception? that exists about your father? That he, uh, uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, well, he did a lot of good things for a lot of people that people don't know. He had um, a lot of compassion for uh, people. He did a lot of things that uh, nobody knows about it make phone calls late at night um, to his staff and made sure that um, whatever person he was talking about got what they needed. Or what it, he, he had a really big heart um, and then uh, as far as um, him using race uh, in the 62 race, uh, to me that's, that's really worse than being a racist uh, at heart. You use it, uh, you know, for power. Uh, so uh, he never, he never, well, he was not really a racist at heart. He just used it, which is worse to me. But uh, he had a capacity to to change because he he could see the suffering that he had caused the African American community, and he went to a Dexter King Church and asked for forgiveness. Unannounced, no cameras, no reporters, nothing. And he asked for forgiveness, and they forgave him. And he was elected governor one more time, and he appointed more um, African Americans to his cabinet and to uh, government uh, uh, ho- government um, uh, appointments than any governor has or has um, since then. Peggy Wallace Kennedy. The book is The Broken Road. George Wallace and a Daughter's Journey to Reconciliation. Peggy, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you.